please project back our seven competencies that we are trying to cultivate. Project them back. So the one we just tackled now is intellectual and professional competencies. It's professional. It has to be relevant to your field or the area where you want to excel. Is intellectual. That's number three. Ticket, intellectual and professional competencies. Ticket. In the morning, we dealt with the social aspect. You know, tick that. So what we're about to deal with now is physical. Physical building, physical capacity, issue of health. Um, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the spiritual all your mind, the intellectual, and all of that. All your soul, the emotional, we'll tackle that later. And all your strengths. Mm -hmm. Then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. That one is the relational, the social, and relational side. So before we now deal with the economic and political aspect of this. So to be a Christian, a total Christian, these are the areas you need to develop yourself, not just the spiritual man. So, the man I'm about to introduce to you is a minister, but has become a professional and distinguished himself on the subject of health. Especially, I'm talking about preventive side to this issue. The subject of health. Because if we master health, we reduce the need for healing. You keep breaking the car every week and be going to God for mechanic work. Where he gave us a covenant of health. So that's what the issue is. You know, is Pastor Dr. Tony Akiemi. I'm so glad to have you here tonight. Give him a big God bless you as he comes. Welcome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity to be here tonight. I greet you all in Jesus' name. What an awesome time we just had. I have been mightily blessed and I've set my own goals. When you see me next year, I'll be taller than this. Can I have my slides on, please? So as to keep within the limit of time... I have decided to be guided by the slide that I have produced. We're talking about men's health today. Men's health. Because um, this is majorly men. And um, I can spot some women in here. You are not going to be totally lost, even though you're a woman. I promise that you'll be able to glean something to take home for your man and all the men in your life. Maybe your dad, your husband, your brothers, and then your sons. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for grace. We ask for unction. We ask that you breathe upon every word spoken, that it might minister grace to the hearers. And I pray that we put into our hands today the keys to help us maximize our health so that there will be no distraction in our lives and so we will be able to focus on the main thing help us tonight and help us always thank you blessed lord in jesus name we pray uh, let me appreciate dr jack as well who made the connection thank you very much He has been my own personal coach in the area of exercise as well. He's been coming over to our church with a few of our leaders to train us and help us get fit. Amen. So we're looking at um, men's health today, what we should all know. Uh, because what we don't know may be responsible for the various failures that we experience, especially in the area of our health, and indeed in every department of life. Uh, the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are not destroyed because there are too many demons. 
Now, people are destroyed because of ignorance. And you see, when we talk about deliverance, one area that believers focus on the most is in exorcism, casting out demons, which is an aspect of deliverance. But that's not the totality of deliverance. In Proverbs 11, the Bible tells us, I think in verse 9, it says, The just shall be delivered by knowledge. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So, it becomes imperative for us to understand a few things that will equip us to take control and take charge. Because if you don't know what to do, then you won't probably do the right thing. At best, you gamble. Sometimes you hit it, sometimes you miss it. But when you know, then you make informed decisions as well as informed choices. Now, why is our health important, especially as men? Our health is important because, you see, it is a healthy body that has the highest potential to live long. A sick body packs up too soon. So health is important for long life to happen. And you see, one of the tools that we need in life to fulfill destiny, to fulfill our visions, to fulfill our ministries, whatever we do, one of the major things that we need is time. If you don't have enough time, you may not be able to complete your assignment. You know, all of us probably have sat for exams before now where they give you six questions and they say answer any four and you have two hours. You can actually answer all the six questions. You know everything. If you were given enough time, you could write a whole textbook. But then they limited you to two hours. And before you said Jack Robinson, you found out that you have only answered two out of the four and they say 30 minutes more. And then you are struggling to make sure you answer the other two and then at the end of the day you couldn't finish and then you scored a B instead of an A. Not because you didn't know the answer but because you didn't have enough time. Same thing applies to life. The things that we need to accomplish if we don't have enough time to accomplish them, they get aborted midstream. Sometimes after we have left because we have not carried it to a point where somebody can take over from there and continue it, it dies with us. But when we have sufficient time, we are able to finish our own portion and then we are able to prepare well for a successor and then we do proper handing over and probably even supervise the transition and let the next person get consolidated before we finally depart. That's how life is supposed to be structured ordinarily. So health prolongs life while disease cuts life short prematurely. And we shouldn't be raising widows and orphans. You know, my Bible tells me in Proverbs, I think, verse 13, verses 20 to 25, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance or bequeaths a legacy on his children's children. In other words, you need to be around to see your grandchildren and bequeath a legacy on them. So if you die before you have finished your task, we won't bury you. We wake you up. Come and finish your assignment. <laughs> you can't run away. You can't shack your responsibility. You have to be here to do it. Now, the second reason why health is important is because health enhances productivity. And productivity is a factor in prosperity. If you are not productive, and then you are just occupying space. You need to contribute something to life. You need to bring something to the table. And it is good health that enables you, at least on the natural plane, to be able to do something productive. If you're sick, you're not likely going to be here in a seminar like this for capacity, human capacity development. You're likely going to be either on a hospital bed or you're on one healing crusade somewhere, <laughs> believing God for healing. But health 
is a major ingredient required for us to be productive in life. Number three, disease does not only stress the sick, it equally stresses our loved ones and it wastes resources. Have you not noticed that for the most part there are many who set out in life working hard to make money, to create wealth, and then God helps them. They actually arrive. They break through. And then when everything is settled to their utter charging, they suddenly discover, oh, health is gone. Now they are willing to spend everything they have accumulated in India and Germany just to get back their health. And so why build up wealth only to waste it before you go? You're supposed to transfer it to the next generation, your children, your grandchildren. You're not supposed to waste everything. Some people die slow, painful, and expensive death. That because they didn't factor the issue of their health into the equation when they set out in the beginning. 3 John verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your souls prosper. Three-dimensional prosperity. And the word is and. The conjunction. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Not prosper or be in health. Wealth and health are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to lose one before you can gain the other. You don't have to sacrifice your health in order to gain wealth. And neither should you waste your wealth to recover your health. You can develop wealth while building health at the same time. That is exactly what God has desired and designed for each and every one of us. And number four, dreams are fulfilled when we are alive to pursue them. If we die midstream, dreams equally die. That's why that teaching that Dr. Miles Monroe did in the 1980s, if you recall, when he was talking about potential, some of you who must have watched the video, and he said the richest place on the face of the earth is the graveyard. Not the gold mines, not the oil fields, but the graveyard. Because he said in the graveyard you find many books that were not written. Many dreams that were not actualized. Visions that were never fulfilled. Songs that were never written. That were in the minds of those who carried them and then they died with it and everything was buried in the graveyard. So you go there, you can actually find a gold mine or something better than a gold mine in the graveyard. But I pray that none of us will go to the grave with what we're supposed to deposit here. The amen can be better. <laughs> All right. So our focus today is to look at conditions that are unique to men. That is health conditions that are unique to men. And then conditions that are not necessarily unique to men only, but they are more common among men. And then, number three, how to prevent them, because most of them are largely preventable. Some of us have been made to believe that these things are inevitable. In other words, once you're a man, well, somehow, somewhere along the line, this will happen when you get to a certain age, far, 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 foul. They don't have to happen. If you know what to do by the grace of God, we can prevent most of them, if not all of them. And those that already have them, there are strategies that can be deployed that can actually help to reverse so-called incurable diseases. And then I will conclude with some general health tips, some take home to practice. So let's begin with conditions that are unique to men. In other words, these are diseases or medical conditions that women don't suffer. By the way, maybe I didn't tell you a little bit by my background. I'm not a medical doctor, so my perspective is not always conventional. I'm always unconventional in my approach. So if you hear anything different from the conventional opinion, just know that I am an out-of-the-box person. Okay? These are conditions that are Peculiar to men, women don't suffer them because women don't have some of these things in their body. Now, prostate disorders is one of the commonest problems that men face, especially in later life, at the time when they're supposed to be enjoying the fruit of their labor. 
at the time when they're supposed to be playing with their grandchildren, at the time when they can afford everything that mouth can eat, that is usually the time when things like this strike and then it just dabaroos everything. And there are principally three types of prostate disorders that men suffer. One of them is prostatitis. In medical language, when you hear any word that ends with itis, it simply means inflammation of. If they say hepatitis, hepa is liver, itis, inflammation of the liver. Then you hear appendicitis, that's inflammation of the appendix. So when you hear prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate. Now, the prostate is a small gland right here, the size of a walnut. It surrounds the urethra like a ring. The urethra is the pipe that conducts urine from the bladder out through the penis when you want to urinate. That is the pipe. And the prostate is around the neck where the pipe connects to the bladder, just surrounds it. It's called the prostate. Now, the major assignment of the prostate is to release certain fluid when a man ejaculates, okay? There are sperms that are produced in the testicles of a man. When a baby boy is born, the baby boy does not have sperms in his testicles. He only comes into this world with two factories that can produce sperms, but does not contain sperms. When the boy reaches puberty, and then he begins to secrete certain hormones that will stimulate production, the factory is primed to start production. And then he begins to utilize stem cells and certain nutrients like zinc, and many, many other things in a process known as spermatogenesis. And a process of uh, 72 days will produce a batch of sperms. And then those sperms are stored in the warehouse, in the epidemics, in the testicles. So when a man ejaculates, some of the sperms are pushed out. Okay? And apart from the sperms being pushed out, the prostate also secretes a fluid that will provide a swimming pool for the sperms to be dumped into so that the sperm will have a medium to swim when they get into the woman and they can swim to the egg to fertilize it. They also have nutrients in them to feed the sperms. That's why sperms can live for three days before they die. But a woman, when a woman ovulates an egg, the egg will die in 24 hours because there's no food to eat. But the sperm has food in the seminal fluid that comes from the prostate so the, the sperm can stay three days. Now that's the job of the prostate. Now, it gets to a point where it can get inflamed most of the time due to infection. It could be viral infection, it could be bacterial infection, it could be fungal infection. Sometimes there may not be any form of infection, but maybe some irritation that will just make it to get inflamed and then it becomes painful and so on and so forth. That is called prostatitis. Usually when a man has that, they treat with antibiotics to clear the infection or whatever other kind of infection it is, if it is not bacterial. Then we have the one that they call BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which simply means big grammar for enlarged prostate. When the prostate begins to get big. And you see, as it gets enlarged, what does it do? Because it's a ring around the pipe, it constricts the pipe. It just closes the pipe so nothing flows out again. Such a man then has the bladder full of urine. He feels pressed. He wants to go and urinate. And he stays there for 15 minutes and nothing is coming out. And the pressure builds up. And the pressure builds up. And then he begins to have a lot of discomfort. It becomes a medical emergency. Then they puncture him and put a catheter. And he carries a bag by the side. So he has some tank to drain water into. <laughs> and he goes about with that. And that becomes a very embarrassing situation. And very humiliating at that. <laughs> and nobody wants to experience that. And that's called benign prostatic hyperplasia. It's not yet cancer. But it's just a benign enlargement of the prostate. Now, that afflicts a lot of men. Now, it may not happen at once with the constriction where there is no urinary flow anymore. It may happen initially with emptying your, bowel, I mean your bladder partially. Your bladder is full. You go to the toilet to urinate. You are not able to eliminate everything. Only half of it comes. The other half is held back. And because it is held back for too long, after 24 hours, because it's waste product, it's a bedrock for infection. Bacteria begin to multiply. And then when infection happens there, it can migrate upwards into the kidneys and cause kidney infection. And all kinds of different problems can arise. So there has to be, the bladder has to be emptied completely as part of your uh, cleansing process so that you don't develop problems thereafter. Now that is prostate enlargement. The third one and the most... Uh, dreadful one is prostate cancer where there are cancerous 
cells actually in the tumor, I mean in the um, prostate. Now, these are the three major things that happen to the prostate. Uh, I'm not going to go into the aspect of treatment. I'll be going into the aspect of prevention because these things can be prevented. You don't have to have them, even if you live to be 80. Now, medically speaking, they say that the older you get, the higher your risk for developing any of these, especially the last two. In fact, they say your age determines your risk factor level. For example, a 70-year-old man, if you take all 70-year-old men in the world together, 70% of them will have it. If you take all the 80-year-olds together, 80% of them will have it. If you take the 90-year-olds together, 90% of them will have it. And if you take those who are 100 years old, 100% of them <laughs> will have it. You know? That's what they say, medically speaking. Now, and what they are reporting is they are just reporting their observation. But it does not mean that that trend is normal. That trend is happening because everybody is doing the same thing. But the few people that are the exception to the rule, either consciously or unconsciously, are doing something different from the general public. And that's why they are the exception to the rule. Now, let's go to conditions that can happen in women too, but they are more common among men than women. The sexual disorders. Now, I decided to use those abbreviations to test you out. When I say ED, what does ED mean? Many people think of executive director. <laughs> what does LOL mean? Laugh out loud. Uh -huh, I knew that. <laughs> okay. And then, so we have sexual disorders that I have listed. There are five of them. And then we have the issue of andropos. Andropos is male menopause. You know women going to menopause. <laughs> and menopause is a cessation of menstruation for at least 12 months consecutively. Then a woman is considered menopausal. But men too go through that hormonal change that is called andropos that begins to affect different aspects of that man's sexual life. Now, let's look at what those uh, acronyms stand for. So, what is ED here? Erectile dysfunction. <laughs> uh, many men suffer that, even in their 40s, some in their 50s. I mean, because of what I do, I counsel many people regularly, and um, 8 out of 10 men <laughs> that show up for counseling have something to do with their sexuality. Um, either their wives are the ones that would drag them, say, let's go see Pastor Tony, <laughs> or they themselves will come behind and say, my wife is suffering and I feel ashamed. I need help so that I can, I can be a man indeed. Some men can't gain direction easily, and when they do gain direction, within seconds the thing will collapse, and then that's it. Some can go more than one, and some can go three. You know, it all depends on a number of factors. And then we have LOL, which means loss of libido. That is loss of interest in sexual activities. I mean, you're a married man, you have a wife, and then you're just not interested, nothing, just not interest you for whatever reason. And then we have the problem of quick ejaculation. Some men, just this week, <laughs> I have seen couples that came to see me, and their complaints, the wife said, look, before he enters, he has released. When me, I am just in A, B. He has already reached Z. And, and the thing is all over. I said, so I'm frustrated. And so when he makes advances, I don't even want it. I said, don't start what you cannot finish. Many men start it, they can't finish it. They call it quick ejaculation. I, I will address some of these issues. I'll give you some tips uh, what to do to deal with them. You know, we don't talk about this openly, um, especially on the pulpit, you know. But in a forum like this, we have the opportunity to be able to address these things down to earth. Is that all right? And then we look at um, low sperm count, which is another problem that most men come up with, especially these days. Very young people. 
20 year olds, 30 year olds, they will release sperm in water, not in day. <coughs> when you do semen analysis for them, <laughs> you find either no sperms at all, or where there are sperms, 60, 70 percent of them are not motile. Some of them don't have head, some of them don't have tail, some have two heads. <laughs> How can such a man impregnate his wife? So you see the case of infertility rising so much because of low sperm count. They call it oligozuspamia. Okay? Some have azuspamia where there is no sperm at all. It's ordinary liquid that the man is releasing. Nothing. And some of them will be bragging. I don't have any problem. When I was a student in secondary school, I impregnated a girl. So how can you tell me? <coughs> But now you can't impregnate one. <laughs> the body has changed. You are no longer who you were when you were a teenager in secondary school. You are now in your 30s, in your 40s. You are releasing water and you are still bragging. <laughs> okay? So, low sperm count. Now, again, I will address and give some practical tips regarding that. Then, um, no sperm count at all. Then, you see, andropos is when there's a particular hormone called androgen that men release, testosterone, and the rest of them. That's what makes you masculine. It makes your muscles, you know, firm and strong. It makes you able to be a man indeed. All the masculine features are driven by these male hormones. Now, females also generate a little bit of testosterone, but not as much as men. That's what distinguishes a man from a woman. Okay? Now, when those hormones begin to decline in production, they lead to changes in the body that lead to loss of muscle tone. Your muscles become flabby, especially when you don't exercise as well. And by the way, exercise helps you to even generate those hormones better. Okay? And then you begin to develop extra tires, see, around the mid-session. Okay? And then loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, and all those things begin to come in. Now, we also have what we call midlife crisis. That usually happens to men. Midlife crisis is a combination of physiological, economic, and social factors that lead to a form of depression and despondency and loss of interest in normal activities that you used to enjoy. That's all combined to create what we call midlife crisis, in, especially in men. Women can experience that as well, but especially in men. Now, for example, a man sets out in school with goals of what he wants to achieve and who he wants to become. And he says, by 40, I want to be a billionaire and retire at 40. And have a mansion somewhere in Banana Island and another one in Dottoda Island and another one. And then now he's 50. He has not bought one plot of land. <laughs> and then he sits back and says, Hey, life is overtaking me. <laughs> I hope I can still reach at least half of my goals. And then he gets to a point where he's overwhelmed and he's wondering, Is this ever going to happen? And without realizing it, he begins to withdraw inward. He begins to feel like a failure. He begins to feel like, Hey, I'm in trouble. And he's no longer interested in anything. Some react differently, okay? Some will respond to that despondent situation by indulging in what we call high-risk behavior. They start drinking more. They start going to the club. They drink away their sorrow. And they start smoking more. And they start being reckless because it's like, look, let anything happen. Make a quench. <laughs> that's called midlife crisis and that can be as a result of unmet goals unmet aspirations and some physiological changes within the body that can lead to all of that and then we also have cardiovascular diseases being more common among men than women hypertension stroke, congestive heart failure, angina pectoris, atherosclerosis, you name them, 
all the different problems with the heart and with blood vessels. They are more common among men. They happen to women too, but they are more common among men than women. Ah, well, maybe due to the peculiar role assigned by society to men. Men are supposed to be the breadwinners, ideally. They are supposed to be the protector of the family. They are supposed to pay the rent. They are supposed to pay the children's school fees. I mean, the women come in to support. I mean, some men I know have abdicated their responsibilities. They are no longer head. They are now figurehead. But ideally, a man should be the head. And being head means assuming your role and your responsibilities as a man. Okay? Those responsibilities that society expects a man to perform, they mount some form of subtle pressure on the man. And they tend to drive the man to put him on his toes. And that makes him to develop, you know, to, uh, to face probably more... Uh, a, a, a higher level of mental stress than the women. Now, women may be involved in physical activities, school runs, household chores, in the kitchen from morning to night, but those are more of, you know, physical activities, and then women are, you know, they are able to operate, they are able to multitask more than men. Men are joro, jara, joro, you know, just one thing at a time. But women have, I mean, the way their brain is configured, they are better able to multitask and handle a number of things than, than men. That's the way their brain is wired, okay? Uh, and so because of the nature of men, we tend to be overwhelmed with a lot of pressure, a lot of deadlines, a lot of timelines to meet, a lot of stress, and that leads to elevated BP and uh, various cardiovascular problems, Okay? And then there's a form of arthritis that is more common among men than women. It's called gouty arthritis or gout. Usually affecting the big toes in the leg. Where well, you can't wear shoes anymore. You have to be, make do with sandals and slippers because of uh, the discomfort that you feel there. And that could be as a result of excess uric acid that is building up in that portion of the body. And the excess uric acid can come from a poor diet because you see I, I grew up in a very poor family so poor that even our poor neighbors called us poor and sometimes in those days my primary school days we could go on for three months without tasting meat okay not even common <laughs> and my mother had a way of preparing vegetable soup with yuru you know yuru uh, and it would taste so nice and she'll tell you, if you're eating this vegetable, it's like meat. Just chew it. Just chew it. <laughs> we didn't really know that what she was giving us was healthy, but we just felt it was poverty. I know there's a psychological feeling that you are being deprived and you go through that. So as I grew up and I managed to go to university and I graduated, I promised myself I would compensate myself. <laughs> You know, and so when I arrived in Lagos, I arrived in Lagos 30 years ago as a youth copper, <laughs> you know, and as soon as I finished serving, I got a job and money was flowing now. Got married, settled, and my wife and I would drive to a jock and torment. There's an abattoir there. We buy the whole tie of a cow. <laughs> You know, by the tongue and the tail and the essay of a bankano, you know, Bokoto. <laughs> and we load our freezer. And, you know, I, I began to gorge, I mean, gorge on meat. <laughs> what my mother and my father couldn't give me. That's <laughs> great enough. Now I could afford it. I did not realize that I was killing myself in installments. <laughs> <laughs> and then you d suddenly discover that you are acidifying your body and building up a lot of uric acid and when you take a lot of milk you're building up a lot of lactic acid and when your body becomes very acidic it becomes a veritable ground for disease to be initiated and to start developing so probably gout is more common among men because now we can afford it. 
So we come home. Two pieces of meat is no longer enough. Now we eat a whole chicken for lunch with one tiny potato by the side. Okay. <laughs> and then a glass of wine to follow. <laughs> and then number four, we have urinary tract infections. It also affects women, of course, but it also it affects men. Um, and then we have sexually transmitted diseases and sexually transmitted infections, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, HIV, dormant uh, human papilloma virus, HPV, and then hepatitis virus, A, B, C, and co. All of these are different forms of infections that people can have, whether male or female. And then we have the issue of addictions, which is also more common among men than women. Women too can have it, but more among men. Alcohol addiction, tobacco addiction, hard drugs addiction. It might surprise you that even some folks in church do it secretly. Where they can't do it openly, they hide behind. And they say it's only 7% that is there. And then we have what I call the battle of the bulge. That's the bubble in the middle. Pot belly. It used to be called a sign of good living. But now we know it's a sign of poor living. <laughs> it's no longer a sign of good living. Okay, that, that's again. These days you see our ladies are flat-bellied. And our men are pot-bellied. That's what you see these days. After the women have become pregnant once, twice, thrice, and they are, they are done having children, then the men take over. <laughs> the men start getting pregnant. <laughs> and then other things like premature grain of hair. It's also common among men. And these are some of the things that can predispose a man to developing gray prematurely at an age younger than necessary. Okay, everybody to some degree will develop gray hair at some point. But when you see premature graying, any one of these could be responsible. It could be hereditary, where some people in their 30s, they're already developing gray. Some in their 40s. Some at 60, there's not a single gray. And they're not dying their head. That is their genetic makeup. Okay, And then there are those who develop premature gray due to too much stress in their lives. And then certain diseases can make a person to age very rapidly. And so they look actually older than their actual biological age. And then nutritional deficiencies can also lead to premature graying, especially when you are deficient in certain trace minerals like copper, zinc, and the rest of them in your diet. Then certain medications and chemicals. Some of us use uh, shaving powders that we mix and it smells so bad and we paint everywhere white and then we scrape it and then by the time you are 32 all your beards are gray because of the harsh chemicals that you have applied over the years. Okay? When people undergo certain uh, medical treatments too, and then they develop gray very easily. Now, the good news is that virtually all the conditions that afflict men are largely preventable and mostly treatable if we know the right steps to take. Now, let me give you some suggestions for prevention because that's what matters the most. How do we prevent these conditions from developing? First suggestion is drink tomato juice regularly. That's for the men, tomato juice. And uh, let me make a distinction. I'm not talking about the packaged tomato juice in the supermarket, because that one is loaded with sugar and salt. But let your wife or you yourself make fresh tomato juice and drink a glass every day. You can drink it raw, which is fine. Or you can drink it cooked, which is okay. Tomato is one of those fruits that you can eat either raw or cooked. And in all your meals, your salad, your, even when you're eating rice, 
you are eating beans or whatever you are eating, you can just slice one or two tomatoes. Uh, in addition, put it on top and eat it along with it. Tomato and indeed every fruit or vegetable that is red in color is medicine for the prostate. If it is red, it is good for the prostate because usually the pigment that makes it red is usually lycopene. And lycopene actually protects the prostate both for, from prostatitis as well as from prostate enlargement and even prostate cancer. So if you take a glass of tomato juice every day at least, that is a protective strategy, a preventive strategy for these afflictions of the prostate. Apart from other benefits that lycopene is going to offer to you. So drink tomato juice regularly and eat bright red fruits for prostate health. Like watermelon, like the pomeg pomegranate. The pomegranate is not a common fruit here, but they are importing it into the country now. If you go to Israel and some other places, you find it all over the place. Actually, they make the juice and sell it all over the place in Israel. And you can buy as many glasses and drink. If you look at the pomegranate, if you actually slice it open, the seed arrangement inside actually looks like the testicles of a man. And that brings me to what I call the architectural correlation. In nature, we find the signature of God in nature everywhere. And almost every seed or knot that you find in nature has a replica in the human body, in the human anatomy. Now, if I ask you, does anything look like beans in your body? What is that? Kidneys. The kidneys look like beans. That's called an architectural correlation. Beans looks like my kidneys. There's something that looks like the, the prostate. Tomato looks like the prostate. Walnut looks like the prostate in shape and in color too. We call the architectural correlation. In the body of a woman, the womb looks like the avocado pear in shape, in size, and the avocado pear is ever pregnant. You know? You never find one that doesn't have pregnancy. So that's the architectural correlation that you find. There's something that looks like the human heart. There's something that looks like the liver. There's something that looks like the bones in our legs. Everything that we have in our body, human anatomy, we have food items in nature that correspond to those items. So the simple trick is that if it looks like it, then it is good for it. Okay? You don't need a degree to be able to know that. You just need to be able to observe that this thing looks like this. So whatever looks like your prostate... Good for your prostate. Whatever looks like your waiting call, it's good for your waiting call. <laughs> Cucumber, carrots, you know. <laughs> okay. Number two tip is adopt an appropriate diet. And what I mean by that is it's a plus and minus situation. Plus means there are certain things that you have to deliberately start adding to your menu. Minus, there are some things you have to deliberately remove from your menu as part of your health strategy. You avoid what I call disease promoters and then you consume more of health promoting foods. There are certain foods that promote disease. There are those that treat disease. Listen to this axiom. Whatever goes into your body is going there to either cause problems or solve problems. One of the two. Anything that goes into the body is going there to do what? Either to create new problems or to solve existing problems. So before you put anything in your mouth, do an interview. Oh boy, what you they go do inside my body? <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? Very simple, straightforward. What are you going into my body to do? Are you going to cause problems there? Or you are going to help me solve problems? The answer determines whether you should go ahead or stop. Very simple. And then number three, stop all high-risk behavior. Like smoking, like alcohol, like sleep deprivation, like violent anger being very temperamental, those are called high-risk behavior. Okay? Some of us need anger management techniques to be able to deal with how 
we burst out at the slightest provocation with road rage when we are driving. A true life story of an army officer in this Lagos who was being driven by his driver who was in uniform and a downfall driver drove rough around him and he told his driver, a soldier to go and double cross him double crossed him stopped the downfall driver and the military officer came out fuming went there and dragged the driver out and gave him very dirty slaps dealt with the driver and then he was <laughs> and the next thing he collapsed and he died true story he was hypertensive and then somebody annoyed him on the road and he couldn't control his temper he went out and he was fuming and he was and then he killed himself now, it wasn't as if the driver used any <laughs> no bichamo <laughs> It was, it was, he just killed himself. So we need to learn how to deal with what we call high risk behavior, including anger at the highest level. And then sleep deprivation. Yes, we all want to succeed. We all want to make it. We all want to advance. But we have elastic limits. There are boundaries we must not cross. You see, even Jesus, in those days, when he and the disciples would have walked, the Bible says, up to the point that they didn't even have time to eat. And then he would tell the disciples, let us come apart for a while. There's always the need to come ye apart for a while. To rejuvenate. To refresh. I'm going to talk about that probably a little bit more tonight. And then number, number four is to engage in regular exercise. 30 minutes daily. If you can't do it daily, at least three to five times a week. Three days to five days in a week. Put in at least 30 minutes. Dr. Jack, I'm sure, will have been doing quite a great deal of that with us. He drilled us and drilled us until our heart almost fell apart. <laughs> but we are the better for it now. Okay? I feel fitter now at 56 than when I was 40. Yeah. To the glory of God. Then, do regular medical checkup at least once a year just to know your numbers, know your status, know where you are. Because sometimes some people have hypertension, they have diabetes, they're not even aware. Sometimes they even have hepatitis, they don't know. It is through annual screenings that you may detect some of these things. Like hepatitis, for example. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. If you don't deal with it, it can be there for 10 years, dormant. No symptom, no sign, no nothing. 15 years, 20 years, and then liver cancer. They say, where did this thing come from? It has been there 20 years ago. But because you never checked, you didn't know. So when you do those regular screenings, it helps you to find it early, and then it's a lot easier to attend to when you find it early than when it has become a monster. And some of these things, they don't stay alone. When they come into the body, they bring entourages along. They want to bring people along with them on their entourage. So you see, hypertension will come in first and foremost by itself. Later, it will send an invitation to diabetes. And then later, it will send invitation to kidney <laughs> impairment. And then before you know it, send invitation to edema. Then before you know it, invitation to peripheral neuropathy. And before you know it, all kinds of different things, erectile dysfunction we follow. It was one thing that came in first and then began to open the door for others to come. But if you caught the first one that came in and you quickly evicted it, the others will not have been able to follow all the complications. So it's very good to do regular medical checkup every year. And then next is to learn stress management techniques, especially those of us who live in Metropolitan centers, a place like Lagos in particular, and uh, Potakot is joining the fray now, uh, but Lagos in particular, is so busy that if you don't learn how to cope with the stress of Lagos, it could be a major issue. I've seen people in their middle ages who 
have almost broken down completely and they've done all kinds of tests on them and everything is normal, 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 normal. And the doctor says nothing is wrong with you. But the man says, but I know everything is wrong. The feeling and everything is just there. And every, all the indices are okay within normal range. It could just be stress. One of them, for example, built a big mansion at somewhere called Abulekun. Those of you who are familiar with uh, that axis in Ojodu, Akute, uh, Alagbole area, that axis, if that going inward, there's a place called Abulekun there. He built a big mansion there, very massive land, fantastic building with beautiful, well manicured lawns and plants and flowers and ornamental plants all over the place. And his family lives there. He's the CEO of his own company. But his business is here in Ajah Leki Axis. And he comes all the way from there every day. He, he says if he doesn't hit the road by 5 a.m. latest, he can't get here by 8. And then he closes at 5, 6. He doesn't get home until 10, 11. He eats dinner at 12 midnight. And then he sets his alarm for 4 a.m. And he runs through that routine Monday through Friday. And why won't your system begin to fall apart? So after swallowing all kinds of chemical remedies and it didn't work, I sat him down. I said, young man, you know my advice for you? Either you let out that place and come and rent a place near... Ah, he said, it's my place is beautiful. I built it purpose-built. Put everything that I want in the house. I said, but you built purpose-built in the wrong place. <laughs> you know, that's not the kind of place you should be if your business is here. I said, okay, a compromise. Why not get a studio apartment here and then you become a weekend husband. So when you come on Monday, you don't go home. You stay here in your studio apartment. Then on Friday, you go on pilgrimage. <laughs> you, know. you know, and he listened to my advice. That was what he did. And you know that resolved his problem. His BP came down. His, all the feelings in his head, everything cleared. He was at peace with himself. He was able to function better. So we need to you know, review our activities and see where we need to make some adjustments in order not to allow stress to deal with us and deal a deadly blow. You see, stress is a component of six out of the ten leading causes of death in the world. Stress is a contributor to six out of the ten uh, leading uh, causes of death in the world. So manage your stress appropriately. And when it comes to stress, there are two major things you need to understand. There is what we call stress events, and then we have stress environment. Stress events are events that happen unanticipated, unexpected. They happen suddenly, they hit hard and run. Okay, those are stress events. If somebody just has an auto accident, almost no vehicle accident takes up to one minute to happen. Everything from start to finish is less than one minute. Every accident you see on the road. They hit, bam. When robbers suddenly break in, unannounced, that's a stress event. Okay? Now, we have stress events in our lives that we never planned for. We don't hope for them. We pray and wish them away. And God protects us from them. But all the same, they still happen sometimes. Not all stress events are negative. Sometimes they are positive. If your wife is uh, in the labor room to deliver, that event is a stress event for her. And for you too. Because you're going back, and you're going forth, and you're going back, and you're going forth, and you're buying this, and you're buying that, and you're paying this, you're paying that. If you're relocating from your rented apartment to your own purpose-built mansion, and that's a stress event. For that week that you're doing relocation and resettling, it's a good thing, but it's stressful all the same. So, but some of them you can plan for, some of them they come unanticipated, especially the ones that come unanticipated. They can deal deadly blows on us if you don't develop a shield around ourselves to prevent them from getting inside. See, a tiny boat can remain afloat on the Atlantic Ocean for as long as possible, as long as the water of the ocean does not get inside the boat. It can keep afloat. And we too can continue to float on in life if we don't allow the stress in the environment to get inside of us. So you have to cocoon yourself. You have to screen yourself. 
And many things are trying to break through. You have to shield yourself, not to allow them to break through into your mind and wreck your psyche at the end of the day. And then, of course, maintain marital chastity and faithfulness to prevent yourself from developing those sexually transmitted infections and sexually transmitted diseases and what have you. Now, there is what we call prophylactic and therapeutic um, approaches to life. All the preventive measures, preventive means prophylactic, and then therapeutic is the curative. Most of the things you do to prevent these conditions are also capable of helping us reverse them if they already exist. So you can as well start it whether you have it or you don't have it. And if you have it, it will help you to be able to beat it. If you don't have it, it will help you not to have it. By the grace of God, I do know that it is almost impossible for me to develop hypertension or diabetes. I don't know how it's going to happen. I just can't figure it out. How is it going to happen? Through faith and food therapy and lifestyle adjustments. We know the dynamics of how these things happen. There's no way by the grace of God that it can happen. That's not arrogance. I'm speaking from a point of knowledge and understanding. The Bible says understanding is a fountain of life to them that have it. Proverbs 16, 23. Understanding is a fountain of life to them that have it. What about those who don't have it? Now, let me recommend some supplements that are particularly very good for men. I have three, three certifications. One in engineering, one in theology, and one in nutritional consulting. Three unrelated fields. <laughs> okay. So let me put on my nutritional consulting cap right now and give you some recommendations. Certain supplements. Now, supplementation becomes necessary because all the nutrients and the nutritional factors that we need to maintain biological health, they are all supposed to be adequately available in our foods. But for two or three reasons, they are inadequate. One, our soils have been so farmed to the point of depletion that these nutrients, we don't allow the soil to follow anymore to recycle and replenish the nutrients that have been taken. So instead, we use fertilizers and use other things to augment. And so the amount of nutrients you find in modern day food is no longer as adequate as it used to be in the past. So that necessitates supplementation. Okay, if it is not adequate, then you have to find a way to supplement it. A supplementary budget has to come to supplement the main budget. And then number two, the way we process our foods also depletes even the little <laughs> that the food took from the ground. For example, you boil your yam. How do you boil your yam traditionally? You slice it, you peel it, you wash it, you put it in your cooking pot, you add water, you add salt, you put it on the stove, you cook it 20, 25, 30 minutes, huh? and then you use your fork to bring the yam out of the water. What have you done to the yam? When the yam was growing in the soil, the yam sucked up minerals from the soil and stored it in the tuber for you. But then because of the way you cooked it, some of the minerals have leached into the water and then you threw away the water. Imagine you getting Lipton tea bag, put it in your teacup, add hot water. What happens to the tea bag? The content of the bag begins to seep into the water. Plain water becomes brown water, isn't it? Now, after the whole thing has seeped from the tea bag into the water, you throw away the water and eat the tea bag. <laughs> huh? That's what we do to our yam. When we boil it like that, everything seeps from the yam into the water, we throw it away, and then we eat the tea bag. So, how are you going to get adequate minerals from the yam? So our cooking methods further depletes the little that the yam was able to pick from the soil. And so that necessitates you to find another way to supply what is inadequate or what is missing. Because you see, there are approximately 60 minerals that are so critical to health. There are more than that, about 84 of them, but at least 60 of them are critical to life. And about 30 vitamins are critical to life. They are trace items of nutrients but the absence of a single one of those 90 elements one of them if it is absent in the person's body can create nine different diseases one so mineral deficiency vitamin deficiency they create conditions we call deficiency syndromes or symptoms 
in the body. If you have vitamin A deficiency, you have night blindness. Vitamin C deficiency can lead to scurvy. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to weak bones, weak teeth, poor immunity, and bow leg, and K leg, and all of those things. Okay, so we need to make sure we supply adequate uh, nutrients to the body, and that can happen when you supplement, and that's where supplementation comes in. So palmetto is a, it's like a palm tree that grows in South America. It has special properties. The oil that they get from that palm is what is called sopametto. It's like your fish oil. You know when you buy fish oil, cod liver oil, you know it's a gel capsule like that. That's how it looks like. And it's available in virtually every pharmacy you see uh, in Nigeria now because the pharmacies are now selling nutritional products now. So you can get sopametto there. It's one of those things that every man should take. It protects your prostate also just like tomato does. And then we have process essentials and pomity. Process essential is actually a combination of all the targeted nutrients for the prostate. It contains soap and metal. It contains uh, pumpkin seed oil. It contains a herb called pygium. And then it contains lycopene from tomato. Okay, all of them put together in one capsule. So they are all from vegetables and herbs. And they call it uh, prostate essentials. In other words, essential nutrients for a man's prostate. You can find it in stores. And then pomiti is a blend of certain cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables include cabbage, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, and so on. All those vegetables that we use for salad, okay, they are called cruciferous vegetables. And they contain elements that are protective against cancers of the breast and of the prostate. Uh, they contain something called indole 3 cabinol or I3C for short. Then they contain anthocyanins, okay? And all of those things help to protect the prostate and protect the female's uh, uh, mammary glands. Then we have GABA, which is an amino acid, which is specific to the prostate. Then we have stress assist and adapt to it. Those are nutrients to help you cope with stress. Because when your body is under stress, your body utilizes certain nutrients in your food, rather than to use that nutrient to nourish your body, it will use the nutrient to produce stress hormones, like adrenaline, cortisol. So the nutrient that should be nourishing your body is being diverted to manufacture stress hormones. So you get depleted in those nutrients. So you need to supply more of those nutrients when you are going through stress. So as part of it is being used for your stress hormones, you still have adequate amount of it to actually nourish your body. That's where those nutrients come in. Then mineral marks or colloidal minerals contain about 74 trace minerals, so you never have a deficiency situation. But I mean, D3 is what the body synthesizes when we stay under the sun. The body is able to produce it. But because most of us don't get enough sunshine exposure, we need to supplement. Because when your D3 level is low, it increases your risk of prostate cancer. Okay, so you need to elevate D3. Zinc is needed in spermatogenesis to produce sperms. And you find it in most grains, especially rice. And that's why it's important for us to eat the right kind of rice to get sufficient amount of zinc. That's where you need the locally grown rice instead of the imported polished rice. When you eat brown rice, or fada rice, abakaliki rice, igbesa rice, the ones produced in Nigeria, they have high level of zinc in them. The polished imported ones that are tastier have zero or very low level of zinc, and that leads to low sperm count most of the time in men. <laughs> and then like copying pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and what have you. Let me say two things that uh, are very important, both for men and women. Now, one, of, one other thing that men can do to protect themselves or to reduce their risk of prostate disorders is for married people, regular sex. I know you will like that one. Or oh, you don't like it, I should withdraw it. I should leave it. <laughs> now, you need to have, scientists have done studies and they say minimum is thrice a week. Three times a week minimum for a man. And then for the women, breastfeeding lowers their risk of breast cancer. The more a woman breastfeeds her baby, the length of time that she used to breastfeed her children, the lower her risk of developing breast cancer in the future. But the less breastfeeding, the higher the risk of developing breast cancer in the future. So 
mothers should breastfeed very well. It looks like everything is bouncing on women. They are the one who must breastfeed those children, and they are the one who must satisfy our God. And it helps them. It helps their husband, and it helps their children. Isn't it good? Yeah. So to boost sperm count for those who have low sperm count, this is my recipe. If you have low sperm count, there's no point taking pharmaceutical drugs to boost your sperm count. There are fruits and vegetables around you that can help you quadruple your sperm count within 90 days. And this is the simple remedy. You eat at least three of each of these items every day. Three tomatoes, three cucumbers, three carrots. You know, I mentioned the architectural correlation. If it looks like it, it is good for it. Tomato looks like the prostate. Carrot and cucumber looks like waiting call. Okay? <laughs> so, you eat three, three, three of each. Maybe one tomato, one cucumber, one carrot in the morning before your breakfast. One tomato, one carrot, one cucumber in the afternoon before your lunch. One tomato, one carrot, one cucumber in the evening before your supper. That's all it takes. You can either eat them one after the other or you chop them into salad. And then eat it like that. And then number two, avoid polished rice and eat brown rice or fada rice instead so you get a lot of zinc. And then you blend or juice the following together and drink at least a glass every day. Pineapple with ginger and garlic. By the way, ginger is also very high in zinc. So when you blend the three into a drink, it's like pineapple juice, freshly made at home. They now blend some ginger and garlic into it. The ginger is rich in zinc. The uh, garlic is a mild uh, antibiotic, so if there is any bacterial infection, viral infection, any kind of thing, it wipes it out because infection can also cause low sperm count. So it helps to wipe Staphylococcus and uh, E. coli and all those other infections that can affect sperm production. That's the garlic. Garlic is also a very mild blood thinner. It thins the blood and improves microcirculation. You know, there are tiny blood vessels in our body that if the blood is too viscous, circulation is very poor in those areas. And there are certain blood vessels that carry nutrients to the testicles where sperms are produced. When those blood vessels become varicosed, and there's roadblock, they call that in medical language, varicocell. And when there's varicocell, there, will, there won't be sperm production because raw material is not reaching the factory. So there can't be production. Usually they will do a minor surgery to open up those blood vessels to allow circulation. But then, if you thin your blood with garlic, then the blood will manage to squeeze through the narrow parts and still reach where it is needed and deliver nutrients for spermatogenesis. That's where the, the garlic... So garlic and ginger are the real thing there. But the pineapple is to do two things. Number one, to improve the taste so you enjoy it. So you don't, you don't see yourself taking medicine. You see yourself taking food. You enjoy it. It's sweet. And number two, the aroma of the pineapple will overshadow the odor of the garlic. Because you don't want to smell garlic. You know, so you use the pineapple to shield that. That's the two jobs uh, that the pineapple is doing over there. Now, those who are diabetic may not want to use pineapple because of the high sugar content. So you want to use something like, you know, uh, coconut to, to blend into it or avocado pear and blend the garlic and ginger into it. And that will help with the diabetic. And then the following supplements will be good to boost sperm count. So palmetto, I mentioned it before. L-arginine is an amino acid, a kind of protein. It also helps to improve microcirculation. And then zinc. Then cranberry. Cranberry is a fruit. It also helps to deal with uh, bacterial infection of the ur urinary tract. And then minerals and uh, protein and uh, omega-3 oil and what have you. Now to improve libido and erectile dysfunction, number one, exercise regularly. When you exercise regularly, the pumping action of your heart is more efficient. And you see, erection is simply blood rushing into the fibrous tissue of the penis, and then it becomes firm. When blood doesn't pump in there, it's very flabby and weak. So when your circulation improves, your erection too will improve. So exercise helps you to do that. And then manage your stress, because when you are stressed, you lose interest in ordinary things of life. But when you are relaxed you are able to get interested. And then you can use the following supplements to boost your erection. There's one called sex stimulant. It's a herbal preparation. Just a few drops under your tongue and it helps you to really get better at it. And then honey goat weed. You see, they found in Kenya a particular weed that goats will normally, when they want to mate, they will go and eat those herbs and then they become aggressive. <laughs> 
You know. <laughs> so the goat farmers decided to also try and eat, and they found that uh, ah, uh -huh. now it's a supplement that is selling millions of dollars all over the world. Honey goat with horn, goat with horn. You know, honey goat. Um, then there's a particular one called steel libido. Then l glutathione is a kind of uh, antioxidant, super antioxidant. The body produces it, but as we age, it declines. So we can augment and then it stimulates to help. Then garlic and cayenne. Cayenne is the pepper, you know, shombo. And then we have uh, a kind of gel that is called a genine male arousal gel. It's a kind of gel, especially where the women are dry and they don't, no matter what you do, foreplay, they don't get wet. You can use that and it helps to lubricate. And that lubrication helps the man too to feel pleasure and the pleasure helps to further stimulate and help him to get stronger. All these are available in uh, health stores, even in Lagos. Now to reduce frequent urination, for those who have, who visit the bathroom all through the night, you see, the way God has designed our body is such that when you sleep at night, certain hormones are released that are anti-diuretic antidiuretic hormones, such that your urine production should either shut down or slow down. So you don't have interrupted sleep. You're supposed to be able to sleep for six hours uninterrupted. So as you go to bed, those hormones are released to shut down urine production. And that's why a normal person ordinarily should not wake up to urinate till morning, or at most once. But when you begin to wake up three times, four times, five times to urinate, one of three problems. Either there is prostate problems, or there is diabetes, or there is urinary tract infection or kidney infection. Those things will make your body to... That is in the physiology of your body. But in, in the ordinary things of life, it could be that you ate too late, and then you drank too much fluid towards the end of the day. Ideally, we shouldn't be eating after 7 o'clock. Ideally. So, if for any reason you find yourself, because you see, this thing is, it has a vicious, uh, it's a vicious cycle. If you cannot sleep continuously, you wake up five times to urinate. Sleep interruption will lead to hypertension. And then hypertension will lead to headache. And headache will lead to further stress. And before you know it, one is reinforcing the other. So if you have a lot of uh, bathroom visits in the night, these supplements can help to further help you. To hold it for longer. It's called goalless or bladder shield. Now to help quick ejaculation. Those who have quick ejaculation. Some people cannot last 30 seconds. Before they release. Now there are tricks you can play. Don't pay me for this one. It's free. Okay. When you are urinating. What you do is. You use your urination to exercise your genitals. When the urine starts. You start. You hold it deliberately. And then you start. And you hold it. Then for, you are strengthening the muscles around that area to help you to hold your ejaculate longer before you ejaculate, okay, when you are doing sexual activity. The second secret or tip is for you to engage in a long foreplay with your wife. In other words, don't be a hit and run man. You know, some men say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You spend enough time to caress, to do foreplay, so that you wake her up and allow her to be well lubricated. That even she herself is waiting now, come inside, come inside, don't waste time, come inside. That when you go in, before you pump two, three times, she herself has reached orgasm. Now, it is not the length of time that matters, but your ability to help her reach orgasm. If she reaches orgasm in 30 seconds and you two release, both of you are satisfied. But if you are the one always satisfied and she is never satisfied, you are raising a tornado. Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> Before you know it, a time will come, she becomes so frustrated, she doesn't want to have any of it. And she will look for all kinds of excuses to avoid sex. And then the frustration turns back to you. Because you are the one now getting frustrated. So you have to learn how to arouse her, how to get her ready, and how to help her to reach ejaculation by doing a long foreplay. Now, if that doesn't work, 
The third secret will help. That is to plan to go for two rounds. Now, the first round may be quick, but the second round that will follow 30 minutes to one hour thereafter will be longer. And so that would help her to also reach orgasm. And then both of you are happy at the end of the day. So those are simple things. Of course, there's a fourth one where there's a special condom now that they make for men that they wear and it will hold them. It won't let them ejaculate quickly. And that can make them last longer. Okay? Uh, now, for general health, now apart from sexual health, avoid the following, in my opinion. Uh, some of us live on caffeine. We need to be very careful with caffeine. Caffeine can, you know, it, it, can, it can have some vasoconstriction. It can constrict our blood vessels and make blood pressure to go up. Caffeine can also serve as a diuretic. It drains a lot of fluid out of you. Drink one glass of cup, coffee and you urinate two glasses of urine. So you have a net negative balance, okay, a deficit, and that dehydrates you. But drink plain water rather than coffee. Then MSG is something that I always recommend that people should avoid because of those issues of digest, digestive health, monosodium glutamate. You find it in most seasonings that we used to cook our soups. Then fried food and fast food should be some of those things we should begin to go slow on or probably eliminate altogether. And then noodles and processed foods, processed meats. When I say processed meats, I'm talking about corned beef, bacon, sausage roll, hot dog, ham, and all of those. They contain a lot of nitrites. And nitrites are confirmed carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. And it can elevate the level of prostate cancer and even colon cancer. Then refined sugar, soft drinks and packaged fruit juices, cow milk, the hormones they used to stimulate the cows to produce milk also creates hormonal imbalance in our own body when we take those things. So I use a lot of coconut milk and almond milk instead of that. So uh, then alcoholic beverages and tobacco are things that we need to be very careful with. Now number two is to drink enough water every day. Make sure your water is purified, it's mineral rich, it's alkaline, it's structured. And then learn to rest properly so that men will not lay you to rest. Okay? Daily rest. Weekly rest, annual rest. Daily rest means find at least six hours to sleep every day out of 24 hours. Utilize 18 hours for other things. Six hours, please. Structure your day. If you miss some hours in the day, compensate for it the next day so that you don't have a deficit in your bank account when it comes to sleep. Okay, then weekly rest. Out of seven days in a week, there must be one day when you are light, when you do light work, when you do things, activities that are your hobbies, things that you enjoy, sporting activities and relaxations and whatever. you. One day in a week at least. And then every year create at least two weeks for vacation. Long-term rest. When you structure that into your annual agenda, it's part of your strategy to prolong your life and to prevent, you know, unexpected outcomes. Then when you sit down, they say sitting is the new smoking. Okay? Can you tell me your neighbor sitting is the new smoking? <laughs> when you sit for two hours, you're supposed to stand up, stretch your leg because of what they call DVT. Deep vein thrombosis. Thrombosis is blood clot. Blood can clot in the deep veins of the leg and that clotted blood can migrate upwards and get into the heart and block a blood vessel and there's a heart attack. It can block a blood vessel to the brain and there's a stroke. Okay, so when you sit for long, you sit in the plane, six hours flight, 12 hours flight, you get up, you walk around. Even here now, can we stand up and then throw our legs? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, you may be seated. Let me finish in two minutes. I'll be done in two minutes. Please be seated. Number four is to eat nutritiously and seasonally. Include fresh fruits in season. One thing you need to understand about the fruits that we have, every fruit has its own season when it comes out. Huh? The thing you need to understand is that when a fruit comes out in a particular season, that fruit contains your vaccination for the diseases of that particular season. That's the way God, God did it. So you just watch it. When it is the season of cold and kata, eh, 
notice that is when oranges come out the most. And they contain bioflavonoids and vitamin C to help you cope with the peculiar ailments of that particular season. So any, any fruit that comes out in a particular season, you enjoy it in that season because it protects your body. That's what I mean by eating seasonally. Then vegetable salad should be a major part of your diet. In fact, it should be 50% of your lunch and 60% of your supper. Vegetable salad. Especially if you are 40 and above. Okay? Then smoothies, vegetable juices, raw nuts, and herbal teas like green tea and the rest of them without cow milk. Okay? Just use honey or other forms of healthy sweeteners uh, to deal with them. So, even if you don't like my face, like me on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you for your time and God bless. We have an institute, we call it Institute of Healthy Living, Rafa Institute of Healthy Living. And we have classes for those who may want to do very extensive training, especially our wives. We can send them to come because they are the commissioner for kitchen affairs. And we have to coach them and train them so they come back home and overhaul your entire kitchen and dietary habits. Uh, the next class comes up next week, October 2 to 6. The last one is December 4 to 8. Next year, we have four modules coming up next year. Our website is right there, tsfhli.com. That's the Shepherd's Flock Healthy Living Institute. Um, you can go there and you find all our details there. Thank you for your time and attention. Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray that you will help your people with commensurate grace to apply and implement the nuggets that they have received today for their benefits. And if there's anyone dealing with any particular health challenge, I join my faith with theirs. Minister healing to them by the stripes of Jesus. I pronounce you healed from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet in the name of Jesus. Recover, rejuvenate, be strengthened, be fully restored to the glory of God. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Everybody said, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, Lord. thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for listening to this message. Be sure to visit dominioncity.cc for all the exciting new content from Dominion City. Or call us on 90 6957 8629 God bless you.